Uh, so I think the recording has just started. So maybe now is a good time for us to start. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome back for the second of his third of his three lectures, Amari Lambert. Um, he's going to be speaking to us today about the formation of, of new species and. I'll send around a, in a little while for those who joined a little late, uh, the link to his, his talk in case you wanna download and follow along. And uh, we just, I think, have posted the, the link for the first lecture uh, talk uh, video and, and the slides. So anyway, um, let me transfer this over to Amore and uh, I'll really enjoy his lecture. Thank you very much, Ivan. So um, yeah. As, as you can uh, remember, the, the, the title of the series is about evolutionary processes and, and patterns of biodiversity. And, and last week, uh, we, uh, we saw some models for uh, the expected diversity, genetic diversity that you could observe in a sample of DNA sequences from the same species um, at the same locus and maybe at different loci and how recombination did couple these uh, genealogies at, as dif at different loci and also how the information on the diversity uh, in this sample could inform us about the past demography of this species. And today I will, I will deal with uh, what happens when you take, instead of the same, um, uh, to take um, individuals from the same species, you take individuals from different species and try to uh, characterize the diversity that, 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 that you observe. So, let me uh, start with a few, uh, few concepts. So in systematics, which is the uh, uh, science of, um, let's say, sorting individuals into species, genera, uh, families, classes, orders, uh, in such a way that is consistent with their uh, evolutionary history, uh, species uh, in, the biological, in their biological definition are groups of individuals which can interbreed. It's also a synonym for mate or hybridize and cannot interbreed outside the group. The, the term that is used is reproductive isolation. And so the basic question that I want to, to address today and, uh, and that I've been interested in from, um, let's say, modernist point of view, is how do new groups emerge from old groups? Of course, this is relevant to uh, this uh, series of lectures because reproductive isolation is a, a very powerful engine uh, for uh, fueling diversity. Uh, it prevents uh, hybridization from blending phenotypes. So instead of having a gradient of all possible body sizes, you might have a species with very different body sizes. And of course, when you sample uh, a pool of individuals from very different species, for, from many different species, you will have a lot more diversity than when you sample them from a single species. Here, so let's say that last week, we talked about uh, the diversity at a sample of DNA sequences and how uh, this diversity was mediated by uh, the genealogy of the individuals that you had sampled. And uh, today I will, I will uh, talk directly about the genealogy of, uh, of these individuals, which is called the phylogeny for the genealogy of, of species. And uh, you, you'll see that uh, we can consider phylogeny from diverse aspects. The tree shape, so the, the combinatorial properties of the, of the phylogenetic tree, and the edge length, so the, the metric uh, aspects of the, of the tree. On the, on the right panel, you can see an example of a, of a big tree it's called the tree of life because it's supposed to encompass all forms of life, uh, actually only a few representative for, from a few species. And, and from that tree, you can see in blue the importance of bacteria and archaea in the, uh, in the uh, living kingdom. And a specific question that we, I will uh, uh, address is whether we can learn from the phylogeny about the diversification process. That is the process that is responsible for, for the emergence of new species and the extinction of, of uh, old species. So these two, these two aspects that I, I mentioned, um, the combinatorial aspect and the, and the metric aspect are um, uh, embodied in, very, in two very popular um, measures uh, used by macroevolutionists. Uh, one is beta and the other is gamma. As you can see from the, the cartoon, uh, beta is negative for, for trees that are imbalanced and beta is positive for trees that are balanced. Okay, so, so I, will, I will talk in the last slides of the, of the talk, I will, I will uh, be a little more, more specific about beta, but uh, from, from now on just, just uh, uh, remember that beta is supposed to be zero for, 
for trees like the yew tree, the pure birth tree, and the Kingman coalescent that I introduced uh, uh, last week. Uh, gamma is, is a measure of relative branch length. It's positive for trees which has nodes uh, close to the tips, and it's negative for uh, uh, trees which have nodes close to the root. And so Kingman coalescent has nodes close to the, to the, closer to the root, so it has a, closer to the tip, so it has a positive uh, gamma. The yew tree has a zero uh, gamma, and as you can see uh, in red, um, uh, real trees are, are known to have a, a negative beta, so more imbalance than uh, what is predicted from neutral models, and a negative gamma, uh, which is different from the Kingman coalescent and more uh, and close to, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my, uh, yeah. Uh, so that's yeah, yeah that's for uh, beta and gamma and, and uh, I will I won't linger much about these uh, these measures but uh, I, I can't resist the, the pleasure of showing you some of these uh, phylogenetic trees or phylogenies here on the right you can see the, the phylogeny of gymnosperms which is a branch of, uh, of seed plants uh, compassing mainly conifers and you can see on the on the top of the tree you can see a very small um, a small subclade, subtree, which is deeply rooted and only counts one species, uh, the ginkgo biloba. And, uh, and this feature and this, um, uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, you know, having this small, deeply rooted subclade uh, at all scales actually is responsible for, for the imbalance of empirical trees. Uh, there are many examples of, of such uh, uh, small and deeply rooted clades here for when you zoom in uh, on the uh, uh, gymnosperm phylogeny for conifers, you can see also in yellow this uh, small clade. Uh, in the phylogeny of birds, you can also see that paleo uh, on the right of the, uh, on, on the, right of the um, uh, circle here, you see that the, the tips of the phylogeny are arranged on a circle and the, the root of the phylogeny is uh, uh, in the center. Uh, these relatives of ostriches uh, and emus uh, and kiwis is a very small and deeply rooted subclade also in the, in, the, in the bird phylogeny. And maybe the most conspicuous example of such a very small subclade uh, deeply rooted in the phylogeny uh, is the, uh, um, the case of, of monotremes, uh, which has only uh, four, the four species of echidnae and the single species of platypus. And you can see on the, on the, on the, in black, on the right of the, uh, of the phylogeny of mammals. So, so let's go for the outline. So in, in the first section, I will talk about uh, models of diversification, which are lineage based, uh, where the species are the elementary particles of the process. And I, I will uh, uh, introduce uh, a dual uh, uh, object to the birth death process called the coalescent point process, analog to the Kingman coalescent. I will then show you uh, uh, the results of three works uh, inferring diversification from phylogenies. Uh, and, and, and then I will come to more microscopic models of speciation, where now we want to account for the progressive emergence of, of reproductive isolation and, and open the species box. Uh, along the way, I will talk about the uh, interbreeding graph, the graph whose edges uh, embody the, the ability to interbreed between uh, populations. And then I will uh, be a little more specific about uh, this uh, puzzle of uh, uh, the imbalance of empirical phylogenies. So in, the, in what is called the lineage-based model of diversification, species are, are seen as uh, the elementary particles of the system uh, that can independently split at speciation events and die at extinction events. Uh, so it's basically a branching process where the birth and death rates, B and D, may depend upon uh, four classes of variables, T, N, A, and I, where uh, T uh, uh, stands for time, absolute time, N stands for the number of co-occurring species in the system, A is a non-heritable trait, a trait whose value uh, is drawn from a, a, a given distribution at each birth event, like age, which is, as you know, reset to zero at each birth, or a heritable trait, uh, typically a trait um, is a phenotype, a, a physical uh, feature of a species like body mass. And as you can see on the left panel, um, the, uh, uh, the trees the, that we consider uh, will be oriented, meaning that the, doubt, the daughter sprouts to the right of the mother and, and the time, and time flows upwards. 
the most uh, celebrated model of such a uh, such a birth death process is the Yule model, also called the pure birth process, where B is constant and, and D uh, is zero, no extinction. As you can see from this, uh, in this model, you, you, there's no information on the process of speciation, but a very nice feature is that it plainly generates a phylogeny from uh, the knowledge of births and, and, and deaths uh, occurring through time. Now, of course, we don't have the whole information about the phylogeny, about the, the, this birth death tree, but the only information that we have is about the phylogeny of extant species. Extant means alive, okay? And, and so if we want to be more specific, we want to ask, what is the law of the reconstructed tree under the birth death model that I, I just introduced? So the reconstructed tree or reduced tree in math uh, is the tree spanned by species extant at, at some fixed time, capital T, or possibly by a, a sample of these extant species. So here's what I mean by a sample. So you, you take the, the tree uh, spanned by all uh, species extant at T, and actually what you do is that you, you uh, keep only a fraction of these by sampling independently with the same probability each species extant at time T, and you look on the right at the tree spanned by sampled species that is generated by this sample. Another thing that we can do is assume that uh, instead of killing uh, or removing species uh, alive at time capital T, we will remove uh, the lineages that were alive at time capital T minus S uh, to model the presence of a max extinction event, we would say a bottleneck in population genetics, um, again by assuming that every lineage, every lineage that was present at that time uh, was re removed and killed with the, its entire descendants with the same probability independently. So are, are we assuming that we kind of know a priori when these bottlenecks occur? Exactly. Or, okay. exactly. I mean, it might be an unknown that you want to infer, but it's fixed. And you, you may have several of these. Okay. So the, the main result that uh, we got uh, in this framework is the following. So assume that you have these birth and death rates that may depend on T, N, A, and I. Recall that T is, is time, N, number of co-occurring species, and A is an unheritable trait. If you're only interested in the tree shape, so the, the, the tree is seen as a combinatorial object, then the reconstructed tree always has the same topology, the same shape, in distribution as the pure birth yule tree, as soon as you assume that B at most depends on T and N and D depends on T, N and A. Okay, so if you, it means that all these trees have the same beta equals zero. Okay, they have the same uh, degree of balance and, and, and more than that, they have exactly the same shape in distribution as if you had a constant birth rate and no, uh, and no deaths, all right? Omar, can I ask, so, I understand the T, uh, what, so N, A, and I, you introduced them, but how can you have, in, in this model, I don't see how you have N bigger than one, right? Because you, you just have these splits. So each time you split, you end up with a different species, right? So N is the, N is the number of particles in your birth death process, if you want. Oh, it's the total number, okay. Mm -hmm. And A and I, how are these determined? So A, so A think of A as the age, of your species, we have one particle which has age A at time T. So that was the time it split off from? Exactly. Okay. And okay. I was what? And I might be uh, some trait, so some, let's say, um, real number that uh, varies stochastically through time. I, will, I won't talk uh, uh, much more about it. But, but that's uh, some sort of possible space-time randomness, or, yeah, space, or time randomness, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, and now if you're interested in tree shape plus edge length, if you're interested in the law of the whole reconstructed tree, then as soon as B at most depends on time and D depends at most on, on time and age or non-heritable trait, the likelihood, the probability of the tree always has a simple explicit product form, which means that the tree is what is called a coalescent point process. So what is the coalescent point process? Assume you're, you're given the law of some random variable, capital H, which is positive. Then the coalescent point process can be generated 
are defined as the oriented tree whose node depths h1, h2, h3 form a sequence of independent copies of h killed at its first value larger than capital T. Okay, so the way you, re you, you, you construct, you build this tree, uh, once you have uh, this uh, sequence of um, h1, h2, et cetera, a uh, uh, sequence with a geometric number uh, of such uh, independent node depths, you see that you can construct the tree by uh, drawing each of these uh, edges, uh, uh, starting from uh, the capital T level uh, and then going down up to uh, down to the, uh, the low, the, sorry, the length of the edge, uh, and then drawing a horizontal line from right to left until you encounter a bold line, right? And so this, you see that this is a very simple way of, of building a tree from a, from a bunch of independent random variables. And so from this, you get a super fast way of simulating the reconstructed tree. And of course, since the likelihood has explicit product form, if you have a parameterization of H, if you know how this variable H depends on the initial ingredients of your model, then you get a very simple and efficient inference uh, method for uh, knowing how, uh, um, for no, uh, knowing how, uh, or discovering uh, the uh, birth and death rates, and how they are depending on, on T and, and A. So, so, so how is the distribution of H chosen, or that's what we're trying to infer? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, sorry if, I, if it was not clear. So if you're given some H, you can construct a, a, a CPP, correspond point process, this way. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that if you started from a birth-death process with B depending on T and D depending on T and A, then the, the reduced tree at time capital T has the same law as a CPP with some node-depth distribution, distribution H. And of course, the game then is to guess the law of H from the birth and death rates, the initial ingredients of the model. And the way that you go from the picture that you're giving to a tree is, is how exactly? Yeah, so, here the, so here the tree, the, the, the tree is, um, is obtained by uh, assuming that the, um, the dashed lines have length zero, but they're connecting uh, two points, uh, two uh, bold points together. Okay, so the, the dashed lines are, so you, you see the, the metric of the tree is given, it's, it's basically a graph, you take the graph distance on this, uh, not the graph distance, sorry, the, you take the usual metric uh, on this uh, on this object, and you connect points that are uh, linked by a dashed line, but the dashed line has a length zero. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. That, like here, right? Like like here. Okay. So then the the, the theorem is a little bit uh, uh, more specific than that, more more precise. It tells you how the law of H uh, can be deduced. So the law of the node depth of these trees can be deduced from the ingredients of the model. So it's convenient to uh, define capital F as one over the tail distribution of H, and then capital F uh, satisfies some uh, uh, linear integral differential equation, which uh, involves B, the birth rate, and G, where G of T and S is the density at time S of the extinction time of a species born at time T. And you can guess that I, I, I didn't uh, show you the detail here, but that it can be expressed in terms of, of B and D quite easily. And actually the result still holds if you assume that there were missing species that you have not sampled all species and there were mass extinction events along the way. Uh, on this slide, I, I listed a, um, a bunch of uh, special cases Maybe you can come back to that slide or to the, or to the, the initial paper uh, after a recording. So the, the special cases include when B and D only depend on time, when B is constant and D only depend on age. So actually saying that D depend on age depends on, or saying rather, saying that D does not depend on age means that the lifetime of a species is exponentially distributed. Now, saying that D depends on age is saying that the lifetime of, of a species can be uh, general, okay? And so in this case, actually, uh, you can use another trick, which is uh, the contour process of the entire tree and show that this contour process is actually uh, what is known as a Levy process. And from this Levy process, you can 
um, retrieve the law of uh, of h of the uh, of the node deaths. And also, uh, if you add uh, mass extinctions on top on the uh, on the initial uh, uh, process, you can uh, deduce the uh, the expression of f thanks to the initial expression of f after uh, after mass extinction. Now, so so let me show you uh, uh, three uh, papers that uh, use this uh, this machinery to in, to infer the diversification process from the mere knowledge of the phylogeny. So the, the first of these papers is a, is a paper by, uh, by uh, my colleagues, uh, Hélène Morlon and Todd Parsons, and also Joshua Plotkin, where B uh, and D only depend on time, uh, parameterized, I think, by, uh, by, exp by exponentials. And what they, what, they, what they did here is that they, they took the, the phylogeny of cetaceans, and from this phylogeny, they inferred how B and D had depended on time in the past. And then on the right, what they did is that they, they, they generated, they, they simulated the, the birthless process with the B and D that, had, that they had inferred, and they obtained this uh, shape of boom and bust from the number of species through time in the past. And, and you see that they actually recover quite well the, what was uh, known from the fossil record, um, um, an, an initially increasing number of species up to 200 to 250 species and then contracting down to the 86 species of cetaceans that are known today. The second example is a sole author paper by, by Tanya Stadler. She used the, the phylogeny of mammals that I showed you earlier. Actually, she, she broke this phylogeny into uh, several subtrees and she inferred the, the way B and D depend, depend on, depended on, on time in a piecewise fashion for each of these subtrees. In blue, you see what the, the result of the inference for the whole phylogeny. The, the most uh, uh, important and, and, and best statistically supported the shifts in diversification. So here you see on the y-axis, the diversification rate, which is just B minus D, the, the growth rate of the phylogeny, the growth rate of the number of species. And you can see that there, there has been a great peak in all these subclades, in all these uh, taxa, uh, a peak approximately uh, 30 million years ago um, coinciding with the uh, cooling of the earth. And the, the other uh, best statistically supported shift is 3.3 million years ago. You, you see a, a, a sharp decrease in, uh, in diversification um, coinciding with high tectonic activity. In the third uh, uh, work where I was involved with uh, Tanya Stadler and Helen Alexander, um, instead of having B and D depend on time, we, we we assume that B was constant and D depending on age, meaning, as I said earlier, that the lifetime of a species could be uh, anything, and we parameterized it uh, in terms of a gamma, uh, a gamma random variable with shape parameter K. And what we did is we, that we used the, uh, we, we first uh, um, uh, checked whether the coalescent point process framework was able to uh, accurately estimate by maximum likelihood, this is what MLE stands for, stand for, so uh, maximum likelihood estimates, uh, if we could accurately uh, estimate B, K, and S, and, and this worked, so we, we applied the method to uh, uh, the BERT phylogeny that I showed you uh, previously uh, with, with uh, close to, uh, to 10,000 uh, species. And the, the result is that the exponential model, uh, which corresponds to k equals one, k equals one means that the, uh, uh, that, uh, the uh, lifetime is exponential and so that d does not depend on age. The exponential model is rejected with a, with a large uh, statistical support. And so the extinction rate means that the extinction rate uh, depends on age. And because the shape parameter was uh, actually estimated to be much larger than one, it means that the extinction rate increases with age, uh, suggesting that species do age. Uh, in passing, we, we, uh, we estimated the average lifetime of species to be uh, approximately uh, 15 million years, and that uh, each species give, gave, um, on average, uh, birth to another species every uh, 10 to the 5 years, uh, 0.1 million years. All right, so, so these lineage-based models of, of macroevolution uh, are very popular. There are all sorts of, of, of such uh, models. So I showed you the time-dependent models, 
I showed you uh, uh, an age-dependent uh, example. Uh, there is also uh, well-known work on diversity dependent diversification, where the rates depend on n. And uh, there is a uh, since uh, 20, uh, 2007, and, and this uh, paper by by Madison et al. Uh, there has been a, a, a craze about uh, trade-dependent diversification. Uh, and, and, and the methods uh, that are associated with these models, BC for binary state, quasi for a quantitative state, high C for a hidden state. And actually, these methods, these methods have been so popular in the last decade that, uh, uh, you, have, that you, you could read up to four survey articles on, on this same topic. So I, I show here on the right uh, the titles of these uh, four uh, uh, popular survey articles. But act actually, the, the problem is that, of course, species are not, are not particles, okay? Uh, and so if you want to get some information about the diversification process, a little more than just the speciation rate or extinction rate, which does not have like, let's say, a biological meaning, at least in terms of uh, what you can measure uh, on the field, um, these models do not inform us about, about, about these. And so, and, and in addition, uh, it is known that uh, reproductive isolation is progressive, it takes time, and so speciation is not instantaneous as in these models. You see on the, on the cartoons, here are two examples. So the, the first example is uh, known as allopatric speciation, where two populations initially coming from the same species are uh, uh, separated geographically and uh, reproductive isolation occurs as a product, as a byproduct of local adaptation. The second cartoon is actually a toy example explaining why this can happen. It's called Betson uh, Dobzhansky Muller Incompatibilities, BDM. It's supposed to uh, model what happens at the genetic level. And so if you, if you can uh, see what, uh, if you can read the, the, uh, the, the cartoon on the right, uh, you see that you start with a um, um, one monomorphic population uh, where at locus one, everybody carries small a allele, so small a, small a, because it's a diploid species. At locus two, everybody carries the small b allele. And then this population splits into two. And as time, uh, as time evolves, the first uh, population uh, sees a mutation from small a to capital A in some individual. And maybe because of local adaptation, this big A allele would go to fixation until everybody is homozygous at this uh, locus. Uh, big A, big A, and the same occurs at locus two in the second population. And so at this point, you have one population which carries big A, big A, small B, small B, the other population which carries small A, small A, big B, big B. And so the hybrids coming from individuals, uh, the hybrids of individuals coming from these two populations will be the double heterozygotes, capital A, small A, capital B, small B. If this, if this double heterozygote is unviable, then you have produced two, two populations that are reproductively isolated from each other. Of course, this takes time, but you see that it kind of solves what is called the species paradox, the fact that at no point in time there has been uh, an, a first individual of a new species. So in, in what's next, I want to show how we can try at least to open the species box and, and propose some let's say, simple and, and, and generic models for the progressive emergence of reproductive isolation. So the idea is that now in these models, species are, are no longer the elementary particles in the system. The elementary particles can be individuals, but I will more often talk about populations. And these populations can replicate when founders from the seed population occupy and colonize a new habitat and found a new population. They can die, of course, when there is local extinction of a population. And we assume that it can mutate. So now mutations are not like a single substitutions as we saw uh, last week, but more think of mutations as, as a major genetic change or a new stage in the speciation process that, uh, that, that um, gets you closer or gets the population closer from a new species. And now what I will assume is that speciation is just a consequence of these phenotypic or, or genetic changes and differentiation 
between populations. And now compared to the lineage-based models where we very simply saw that uh, we saw that we very simply had uh, uh, new species occurring and uh, very easy to define the species phylogeny and we had a very, a very efficient way of simulating and inferring from the phylogeny. Now we, we need to have a natural way of partitioning the particular the populations into species according to their uh, phenotypes or their uh, genetic differences. A unique way of defining, of defining the species phylogeny consistently with the genealogy of particles, meaning that if particles or populations are uh, closely related, then they, they should be in the same species, and if they are distantly related, they, they should be in different species. A fast algorithm simulating the partition and the phylogeny, and D, a statistical method for the inference of the microscopic parameters of the process. Uh, in the, in the lineage-based models, we, we had A, B, C, D for free, and now we have to check that we, we can uh, get these, uh, these uh, uh, items in our model. So le let me present you uh, three, let's say, embryonic works in this direction, uh, which, which uh, uh, are attempts of, uh, attempts of modeling speciation uh, from, let's say, first principle. So the, the, first, uh, the first example is called the protractic speciation, has been proposed by uh, uh, James Rosendale and his, uh, his co-authors. Uh, and so his idea was that speciation was not instantaneous, it takes time, and, and that species uh, can be seen as an ensemble of populations, uh, as I just, uh, as I just uh, said, uh, and that each population gradually diverges from mother species. And so the idea is very simple, is that these populations, as I said, go through mutations, they accumulate mutations, and speciation is complete when the population has accumulated K mutations. Okay, so K is the threshold for the new species to arise. The newborn particles are called incipient. This, the first stage in which uh, they are born is called incipient, it means that they belong to the same species as the mother population. And after having accumulated K mutations, they arrive in the stage which is called good, meaning that they now uh, uh, start a new species. So it's, that's for A, it's, it's, uh, it induces a natural partition of particles into species. And now for the, for the phylogeny, what, what we did, what, what Rampal Etienne, our, our co-author, did uh, in, the, in, in the work that I will now present, we will assume that each species is actually represented by one single particle. And so the phylogeny is defined, that's for B, as the tree in the genealogy of particles spanned by these representative particles. Okay, so it's so now we have uh, we have solved A and B, and now we'll see how we can do C and D. So how, how can we choose these representative particles? Here you see an example of a of a tree of particles where the dashed lines so tree so the time flows uh, upwards. Dashed lines are uh, are incipient stage. Uh, and uh, the uh, bold, sorry, the uh, um, uh, solid lines uh, mean that uh, these populations are in the good, st good stage. They are uh, a new species. So here, k, k equals one, and you see that at time capital T, there are four populations alive. Population one is in the good stage. It's a brand new species. Uh, population four is in uh, the incipient stage, but since it's the only representative of species B. Species B is represented by, by this population, population four. And you see that species A is represented or has two uh, descending incipient species at time capital T. And what we chose is to, uh, is to assume that the representative population of species A is the leftmost particle in the natural tree orientation. And so species A is represented by population two. If we make this assumption, and if we assume that the population birth rate does not depend on speciation stage, then we could show in the paper that is uh, mentioned on top of the slide that the tree spanned by the representative particles, one per, uh, one per, uh, one per species, the leftmost in the, in the tree, is a coalescent point process with explicit no depth distribution. And so we are back to uh, what we know. Uh, how to simulate very easily and how to infer uh, because the, uh, the, the phylogeny is again a coalescent point process 
but now parameterized by the microscopic parameters uh, or the microscopic uh, yeah, ingredients of this, uh, of this uh, protracted speciation model. So what, we, what we've done then is to uh, try to apply this method and to apply this model to real data. So we first tested the model on, on simulations and, and we actually realized that we could not infer the uh, individual parameters of the, of, the, of the model, but that we could infer a composite parameter, which is the duration of speciation. So what's the duration of speciation in this framework? It's the waiting time until an incipient species has uh, a good population in uh, its descendants. So for example, if I go back to the previous slide, you see that the, the time at which the population B arises is the, the, the time it, it took for speciation to occur. And so we applied this by breaking down the bird phylogeny into uh, uh, 30, uh, 46 bird clades. And you see on the left the results of the analysis where we infer this duration of speciation under the protracted speciation model for each of these 46 bird clades. And you see this very nice range of uh, estimates going from uh, 10,000 years to 10 million years. And these estimates are actually uh, in agreement with the uh, uh, estimates that, that I showed you uh, with the age-dependent model earlier. So, in, in model, so let me now introduce model two. So model two starts from the uh, realization that uh, there's no, we, we don't have any knowledge of, of who is the mother species, which is actually a problem, uh, which formally is, is formally the same as uh, guessing the ancestral state uh, when, you, when, you, when you have a, a sample of, of DNA sequencing. And so because we don't have the knowledge of the mother species, we cannot really partition particles uh, with reference to this mother species, and we, we can only uh, sort uh, particles in different species according to their differences. Okay, and so the two natural rules that you uh, would like to uh, to apply in this framework uh, are the following. For example, you can fix some threshold Q, and uh, rule one is to uh, uh, consist in a, in a putting in the same species all particles that are separated by less than two mutations. And rule two is basically the converse, saying that particles by separated by more than two mutations are in different species. Of course, what you would like is to have a partition in two species which um, satisfies the two rules simul simultaneously. But if you look at the example on the right and you take Q equals one, you will see, for example, that if you apply rule one, particle one and three will be in the same species because they are separated by less than one mutation. Three and seven will be in the same species because they are separated by no mutation. Seven and nine will be in, in the same species because they are separated by one mutation. And so one and nine will be in the same species. So and this X is la labeled by alpha, beta, gamma, delta are the mutations. They are just mutations that occur, let's say, at different places on the, uh, on the, on the genome. But yeah, maybe forget, it's just to say that there are different mutations occurring at different uh, loci. And so you see that if you apply rule one, one and nine will be in the same species, but, but this contradicts rule two. And so there's no way actually of, 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 uh, of reconciling the two rules. And actually, even if you only take one of these rules, there are multiple partitions that satisfy either rule. For example, uh, rule one, the partition where you put all particles in the same species satisfies rule one, and the partition where you put every single particle in a different species satisfies rule two. Okay, so it's not clear how you can partition in two species. That's problem A, and even less clear if you want to uh, define the phylogeny from this partition. Now, a nice uh, situation happens when each subset of tips in your partition is monophyletic. What does it mean monophyletic? It means that it forms a subtree. Okay, so it, it includes all the descendants from their most recent common ancestor in the genealogy. And it's not easy, it's not difficult to see that each species form monophyletic subsets, then there is a unique phylogeny that can be uh, consistent with the genealogy, and that's obtained by collapsing each subset of your partition into one single tip in the phylogeny. And the good news is that 
we can uh, define uh, naturally uh, some monophyletic partitions that satisfies that satisfy the rules that I just uh, uh, that just stated. So that's a, that's a result obtained with Marc Monceau, a former PhD uh, of mine, uh, co-supervised by Hélène Morlon. And the, the result says that there is a unique species partition that is the finest monophyletic partition satisfying rule one. And there's also a unique species partition that is the coarsest monophyletic partition satisfying rule two. Okay, could you explain again what monophyletic means? So monophyletic means it's, it's a, um, a property of a subset of tips which are related by a tree. And monophyletic means that the subset forms a subtree in the genealogy. Otherwise said, it says that this subset contains all the descendants from the most recent common ancestor of the subset. For example, six and seven is monophyletic. Four, five, six, and seven is monophyletic, but six, seven, and eight is not monophyletic. Is that clear? Yeah. So we, so we use that uh, first rule uh, to uh, apply this model to uh, real data. So uh, uh, forgive me about this dense slide. We started with an individual based birth death process with rates B and D for the particles. Poisson mutations at rate theta. And then we define the species and the phylogeny from the definition that I just gave, the finest monophyletic partition, such that two clonal tips belong to the same species. That's Q equals one, rule one. That's for A and B. So we have a, a nice way of, of partitioning into species and defining the phylogeny from this monophyletic partition. And now for C, we showed that actually if you, if instead of keeping, of bookkeeping all the mutations in the genealogy, you only keep the information of state one or zero of the lineage, which actually is saying that a lineage is in state one, if the type that it's carrying at, time, at, at the time you're looking at it is not represented at time capital T and state zero, if the type it carries will be represented in the future, at, at time capital T, then with these three type of, uh, of uh, if, if you, let's, sorry, if you enlarge the, the, the information of the genealogy with these states, uh, then you, you can simulate very rapidly the, the phylogeny by collapsing into one tip, all the descendants of each node where the two descending subtrees are in state zero. And then for D, we had what is known as a peeling algorithm, which is a way of, let's say, dividing and conquering the, uh, the uh, let's say, the exploration of the, of the tree and, and computing uh, the, the likelihood of a given phylogeny under the, under the model. And what we showed is that when we apply this method to uh, simulations, we, we get very precise estimates, as you can see on the well-behaved uh, contour uh, likelihood uh, uh, contour plot on the right, very precise estimates of two parameters, theta, the mutation rate, and B minus D, the growth rate of the genealogy. And at the end of the lecture, I will show you uh, uh, a nice application of, of, the, of this model. So the third model is called the split and drift evolving graph. And if you recall what we, what we just did in, in model two, you could actually imagine that we, what we did is actually draw an edge between particles that are separated by less than Q differences. And the idea is that basically the, the species are the connected components of the graph that you uh, define this way. The, the fact of knowing whether an edge exists or not depends on the whole genealogy and the mutations that are on it. But our idea was to now explicitly model these edges. And in the process, in the, sorry, in the framework of uh, systematics and, uh, and the biological definition of species, then you declare that an edge uh, is present between particles as soon as they are able to interbreed. And our, our, our goal here was to uh, have a simple model uh, where interbreeding these edges evolve by replication when the, 
when the uh, particle split and spontaneous divergence that we call drift when the, uh, the edges after some random time uh, spontaneously disappear. Note that this interbreeding relationship is not transitive as you can see from this example here, well-known example of, of ring species uh, starting with a, uh, so that's a species from the uh, genus and satina of, uh, of salamanders it starts with the uh, one ancestral species in the in the northwest of the of the USA, and uh, you see that it diversified into uh, different morphs uh, on the on the two sides of the San Joaquin Valley, and uh, here two adjacent uh, populations can interbreed, but when the uh, when the uh, morphs when the populations uh, meet on the southern side of the of the San Joaquin Valley. The two uh, populations here cannot uh, interbreed. So you see that this interbreeding graph uh, is not transitive. It's cyclic minus one edge at the uh, south, uh, southern end of the, of the valley. And so what we would like to do is to define species as the connected component of the interbreeding graph. So the, the, the model here is as follows. It's, a, it's again a model where there are births, there are deaths, and there are mutations. Uh, but mutations are actually a little bit uh, simpler. They just involve edges that disappear after some random time. So here we assume that the number of population, the number of particles is fixed, equal to n. And the birth and death occur according to a Moran model, which is actually the uh, counterpart to the uh, Wright Fisher model in continuous time. And this goes as follows. I treat one half per oriented pair AB of particles or populations. Population B goes extinct, and simultaneously A goes, gives birth to a new population called A prime. And now, how does the graph evolve at that time? Since A prime is the daughter of A, it's assumed to be clonal to A, and so it's assumed to be able to interbreed with all the, number, the neighbors of A. So you copy all these edges, and you add a copy between A and A prime, the mother and the daughter because they are clonal to each other, they are assumed to be able to interbreed. And a divergence is just assuming that each edge disappear, disappears after uh, an exponential uh, time with parameter r. So in this paper that uh, you can see the, the title on the top of the slide, uh, we did not really uh, uh, study the phylogeny, but we studied the, the stationary state of this process, which is a, an irreducible uh, Markov chain on the, on the finite space of, uh, of, of graphs with n uh, vertices. And so it's a very simple two parameter model where n is the total uh, capacity of the, of the, uh, of the meta population and r is the rate of evolution of reproductive isolation. So th as far as uh, a simulation is, uh, is concerned, uh, we can use the fact that the genealogy of particles is given by the Kingman coalescent that you can remember from uh, last week's lecture. And the presence of an edge between I and J uh, depends on a Poisson process uh, with rate R uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the pair IJ. And so if there's an atom of this uh, Poisson point process that has occurred before the time to a most recent common ancestor of this pair of particles, then the, the edge has disappeared, has, has disappeared. And so from these two independent, uh, very simple objects, we can define and, and, and fast uh, simulate the graph at stationarity. Now we can also derive some, uh, uh, some mathematical results on, on this graph. Okay, could you go back to the last one? I, I just want to make sure I understood. So, so you take two independent things, one which is a, a tree, something like a Kingman coalescence, and the other which is a labeling on the pairs uh, i j, and then how do you put this together? So how we put this together is that a net, so if you have an edge uh, between i and j, it has it was born at the time of birth. Okay, it was born at a coalescence event. If you look backwards in time, between i and j. Okay, and so this edge is still alive if the Poisson point process labeled i j has no atom since the, since the coalescence time. Okay. Okay? So for, yes, that's rate R. 
the two three connection remains, but the one two doesn't, I guess. Right. Exactly, the one two doesn't, uh, and the one three does. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the because the uh, the red cross here is upstream of the coalescence time between one and three. Okay. Okay. And so some uh, uh, simple mathematical results that uh, you can get using this uh, this picture it, it goes as follows: If you fix k nodes in the uh, in the graph, but you, and you're interested in uh, uh, knowing whether uh, all these k nodes, sorry, if all the edges are still present, then by a standard argument of competing clocks, the probability that these k nodes form a, a clique or a complete subgraph is the probability that between two coalescence events, none of the, of the uh, edges has disappeared, okay? And so, uh, and, and so it's simple to uh, uh, calculate this as one over one plus r to the k minus one. And in particular, if you take k equals two, then p uh, two of n and r is the probability of edge presence between these two uh, nodes. And so you can get uh, a first uh, sense of how the degree of a fixed node depends on the parameters. Uh, the expectation of, uh, of D is uh, N minus one, the number of other nodes uh, multiplied by P2, one over one plus R. And so this behaves as N over R, as N and R go to infinity. So what we did next was to check whether uh, D of N and R rescaled by this uh, parameter uh, uh, converged and here, here's what we got. So if D stands for the degree of a fixed node and CC for the number of connected components in the graph, what we obtain is that assuming that N, as N goes to infinity, R goes to infinity and R over N goes to zero, indeed D rescaled by N over R converges in distribution to a size biased exponential variable with parameter two. And we, we also obtained uh, convergence. We also obtain actually uh, the, um, an explicit uh, formula for the distribution of, uh, of the law of, of D for fixed N and R. Uh, and we obtain the, the tightness, not the convergence, of the number of connected components divided by, by R. And so you can see a simulation on the right where N is large, R is large but much smaller than N. And you see that you have approximately N over R connected components where the degree of, of each node is of the order, uh, sorry, R connected components, and each node is connected to N over R uh, other nodes. And so you see that, for example, this uh, very simple model gives a very a clear prediction on the number of species. And it says that basically this number of species should not depend on the total number of, of individuals or, or particles in the meta population, but only on the rate of reproductive isolation. And so I think that here with this model, we have a, a quite promising model, which is a highly tractable, neutral in the sense that it does not involve a selection for the evolution of reproductive isolation. There are lots of open questions remaining. Uh, for example, the convergence in distribution of uh, this number of connected components divided by R, the distribution of all the sizes of connected components, maybe also the convergence in the graphon sense in the dense regime when, when R is constant, and the, and the degree of a fixed node uh, is of the order of n. And, uh, and uh, as you see, we, we did not at all tackle the question of how to define, uh, simulate, or characterize mathematically the, the phylogeny. But there is a very natural way of defining the phylogeny because connected components have a genealogy. If you think of extinction, a connected component dies when the last individual of the connected component dies. And it, it gives birth when two connected components are, uh, for example, linked by a single edge and this edge disappears. At this point, you have a birth of two connected components. And of course, we're far from uh, making inferences, but uh, uh, this model has uh, uh, very uh, uh, general predictions and uh, not only in terms of the phylogeny and the number of species, but also in terms of abundances of, uh, of uh, species. And this is something that uh, is uh, currently in progress with Francois Bienvenu, who is a, a PhD a student uh, who uh, defended a, a, year, a year ago. So you see uh, the various uh, simulations uh, here on the bottom. 
So for those interested, uh, I, I would be glad to take your, your uh, to share uh, your ideas, our ideas. So just, uh, just to make sure I understand. So the, you take this model that, that you were describing where you have a coalescence and then you have this these point processes, you create uh, your random graph in this way. You look for this sort of stationary measure for this process in time. And this, this is what you're studying then the large n limit or you know, the large number of particle limit. And you're finding these sort of cool features. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. yeah exactly. So, so, so what, I, what I showed here on this picture is really the, the stationary state of the graph. But these connected components have some evolutionary history. They have a file, they are, they, are, they are really like related by, by a phylogeny, a genealogy. And this is something I would like also to study. So in the abstract, I had mentioned two applications. One was this uh, question of how does the interbreeding uh, graph look like at stationarity? And the second one for the five minutes remaining is let's say a, a more a deeper um, dive into uh, this question of beta and the imbalance of tree shapes. And actually this question goes back to uh, works and questions by uh, the famous uh, probabilist David Aldous, uh, who, uh, who um, came up with a, a model for a random binary tree T sub N uh, with n exchangeable tips labeled by one n. Okay, so what's uh, what's the, is the model that he proposed? So he, he assumed that we are given distributions q n on one n minus one, and we are given uh, n balls which are colored and actually labeled by one n. So you start from the bottom of the picture. You have these uh, six colored balls. You draw some uh, variable k n k six according to the distribution qn, you find four, and then you randomly sample uniformly four of these balls, you put them into one box, and the two others into another box, okay? And you do that again and again, independently, until every colored dot, every ball, is in a single, uh, is in a, a different box. When you do that, once you have done that, you can actually uh, copy that and apply the same procedure to a tree, right? So meaning that when you divide your uh, colored balls into uh, a box with four and a box with two, you can say that you will share the labels, the corresponding labels to the left part to, in the left subtree and the two others in the right subtree, left and right having no importance here, right? And so you do that again and again, and you produce a binary tree where all the labels play the same role, they are exchangeable, and, uh, and with, with n such labels, okay? Is it clear? So you, you do that using qn first, and then q4, so q6 first, then q4 and q2, then q3, etc. okay? And a nice uh, feature of this model is that when you take qn uniform, it yields exactly the same tree shape uh, as a, a Yule tree stopped at a fixed time, and also as the Kingman coalescence. Now, if you, if you remember, I, I talked about uh, sampling consistency last week. So recall that Tn is a, is a random binary tree with n exchangeable tips labeled by one n. And if you call T prime n the tree obtained by removing one tip from Tn plus one, say the tip labeled n plus one, but they play the, the same role, then the model is set sampling consistent if Tn and T prime n have the same distribution. Of course, this uh, property is quite desirable in, uh, in biology. You don't want to have your, your sample depend on, on the order in which you have, uh, uh, you have uh, sampled your, your individuals and, and that not depend on if whether if you have like sampled, uh, uh, let's say n plus one and then removed one, you don't want the sample to be different from just taking n from the beginning. And of course, the uh, uh, archetypal, archetypal example in the Kingman coalescence. So a way of, of constructing a, a sampling consistent model is as follows. So assume that you were, were given some, some measure or some law mu on the unit interval, okay? And so here on the right, you see uh, the unit interval. 
So what you do is that first you, you uniformly distribute your color dots in the unit interval. Okay, so that's the bottom of the picture. Okay, so you uniformly distribute them independently in the uh, unit interval. And then the first thing that you do is that you fragment the unit interval according to the, the measure mu. That, that's the cut point uh, drawn in red here on the picture. And then you consider separately each of the two intervals. And that's, that's makes, that makes a sharing between the, the, the balls that, the, or the dots that are on the left and the dots that are on the right. Okay? And you do that again and again until all the dots are in different sub-intervals of the unit interval. And that uh, produces a tree. And why is that sampling consistent? Because of course, if you, for example, look at the subtree here and whether you can uh, generate the subtree, like starting with uh, uh, five colors or six, or six colors and then, uh, and then uh, take away one color, you, you get the same tree, right? Actually, you can even couple all these trees in the same state, in the same space, same probability space by um, uh, draw by uh, sorry by uh, uh, throwing all the the, the integers uh, from the beginning in the unit interval. Actually, the converse was proved by uh, Haas, Miermont, Pittman, and Winkel in, in, in 2008 using fragmentation processes, and uh, and I did the same but without using uh, fragmentation processes recently, and they showed that this tree model is simply consistent if and only if we are in this situation where in which case qn of i can be written as in the as on, on the red with the red expression here on the bottom of the picture actually you can there's a more general um, a model where you can add, add what is called erosion meaning that uh, sometimes you will um, put one of these dots uh, at random in an isolated box and uh, the nice thing is that when uh, Aldous applied this model to uh, real data, so he uh, parameterized the, the measure mu by uh, uh, the beta uh, distribution, so a symmetric uh, density x to the beta, y minus x to the beta. He, uh, and so that imbalance decreases with, with beta. Uh, he showed, and uh, Bloom and, and Francois, uh, a few years later, showed that the beta that you estimate from empirical trees is not at all uh, close to zero as in the Yule tree or in the Kingman coalescent, but it's uh, uh, centered on minus one. And so the, the question that, that still remains uh, up until today uh, that he asked uh, 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 20 years ago was if there are mathematically simple or biologically plausible stochastic models for phylogenetic trees whose realizations mimic this property of having this imbalance uh, of beta close to minus one rather than close to zero. And so I want to give here, and then I, I will be, I will be uh, uh, it will be over. Um, I want to give here a few partial answers to that question. So first, if you remember one of the first uh, slides, I showed you that when you look at birth death processes, the reconstructed tree always has the same tree shape as beta equals zero whenever b only depends on t and n and d only depends on t, n, and a. So in this whole class of birth death models, you will never generate reconstructed trees which have the imbalance observed in empirical trees. Now if you look at the models that are introduced afterwards, model one, prototypic speciation, also produces coalescent point processes, and, see, so, and so they have the same tree shape as beta equals zero again. Now, if you look at model two, speciation with genetic differentiation, you can see on the right panel, top right, that the, that the, the, the simulations that we made with our model, with the parameters that we had inferred from real data, are similar to the real values of the statistics that are observed uh, in, in empirical trees. So it means that one, possible, one possibility is that this neutral model where you, um, where you cluster uh, uh, individuals which are of the same type provided that they are in the same uh, subtree, um, which mimics the way systematicians uh, partitions, uh, partition uh, populations into species might be responsible for, for this uh, uh, empirical imbalance. Another simple explanation which has been proposed in, in 2015 
is that speciation rate depends on age. So in that paper here that, you, that I, I cited here in the bottom, in the bottom uh, B depends on age uh, like a, a power function, A to the phi minus one. And what they did is that they, they estimated phi uh, on, uh, on more than 9,000 empirical species trees from tree bays, uh, a famous data, database. Uh, they saw that phi was between zero and one, indicating that uh, speciation, speciation rate decreases with age, so that species do age. And the distribution of beta that uh, is generated by these phi estimates, as uh, you can see on the, on the bottom panel, fits well the, the, the distribution that I showed you here uh, in the Bloom and Francois paper. So that may be an alternative explanation for this imbalance observed empirically. And uh, that's all I want to thank my uh, uh, co-authors on all these uh, papers that I uh, rapidly uh, presented, uh, especially so Marc Manso and Francois Bienvenu, who are PhD students, uh, very talented PhD students in, uh, in, uh, in the group. And they are uh, co-supervisors, uh, Hélène Morlon and Florence Debar. And uh, I give you the few uh, references that you can uh, browse uh, on the recording. And I thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you very much, Amore. Uh, everyone should be able to unmute themselves. So if you want to join with me in a round of applause. And uh, we can take a, a bit of time, but maybe if people need to leave, they can go as well. Uh, if people have questions, and I know that there were some in the chat, I'll just mention um, the most recent, which is uh, from Francois Bonhomme. Uh, how do you deal with the secondary gene flow after incomplete RI? Uh, or how do you deal with incomplete RI because you have a very simple threshold to define RI? Maybe you can remind us what RI means as well. So RI is a reproductive isolation. And um, yeah, so, so actually I, I do not allow in the, uh, in the models, I do not allow um, um, uh, how do you call that, um, rever reversing isolation. So you can only increase reproductive isolation uh, by spontaneous divergence between, between particles. So I, 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 never, I never like model uh, secondary contact or, or uh, let's say reversal to, uh, to, um, to no, to no uh, reproductive isolation. Yeah, there's another question. Is selection an alternative explanation for beta equaling minus one? Yeah, I don't, yeah. So the problem is that it's hard to really like uh, picture how selection occurs at the uh, at the species at the species uh, level, right? So of course you might assume that uh, um, a trait uh, like I, you know, a heritable trait, acts. Uh, at the species selection level, meaning that, for example, a species which have like a smaller body mass speciate more than others, uh, then of course you will produce a more imbalanced subtree. Yeah, sure. So species selection can be an explanation for, for imbalance. Okay. okay. Well, so maybe now is a good time to end. Um, so. Uh, again, we thank Omar for his excellent lecture and we'll post the recording and the slides on the website, uh, similar link to the one that we gave before, uh, so the IICD website. And uh, we'll uh, also send around a reminder for the third talk, which will occur same time, same place uh, next week. And then we'll have a one week gap and then we'll start up with Alison Etheridge's talks. Okay, well, good to see everyone. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. See you next week. Yep. Bye. -bye.